This Sunday on Capital Connection, the Democratic defection. Six women in the Democratic Party call for Speaker Madigan to step down now. Plus, the push to protect our veterans from the coronavirus. President Trump's Secretary of the VA joins us for a wide-ranging discussion. It's all coming up on Capital Connection. From the Illinois State Capitol Rotunda, Capitol Bureau Chief Mark Maxwell is asking the tough questions. This is Capital Connection. Welcome to Capital Connection. I'm Mark Maxwell reporting from the Illinois State House on this Sunday, August 2nd. Pressure is mounting on House Speaker Michael Madigan to resign in the face of ComEd's corruption investigation. The top executive from that company apologizing to the public at a hearing before the Illinois Commerce Commission earlier this week. One day later, House Republican leader Jim Durkin dropping his condition that Madigan resign only if those allegations were proven true. Now upping the call saying Madigan should resign immediately. And more importantly, six Illinois Democrats, three in the House and three in the Senate, are calling for Madigan to resign effective immediately. But Governor Pritzker wouldn't go that far. But there's also more that we need to learn, and the U.S. attorney clearly is on a path here. We're going to learn more. There is no doubt about it. And from that information, it will inform us how to write the laws to prevent that from happening in the future. If the speaker called you today, would you say stay or go? Well, I've been very clear about my position about this. I, I mean, I think the speaker has an enormous amount to answer for. There are questions that the public needs to hear the answer to. I do, too. And so that's what I would start with, questions, you know, about how, exactly what happened here and what these allegations that are being made that are somewhat vague, frankly. I mean, there's more information you would need. Uh, but, but in that uh, de the uh, uh, deferred uh, prosecution agreement, the DPA for ComEd, there is obviously reference to the speaker and, and to people around the speaker. I want to know those connections. I want to understand what it is the speaker was doing. He needs to answer these questions. I think many, many of us have called for that. Joining us now is House Democrat Stephanie Kifowit from her home office in Oswego, Illinois. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us. A retired Marine, uh, also one of the six Democratic women who are right now calling for Speaker Madigan to resign without placing any condition on that call. Uh, Representative, some of your colleagues are saying Speaker Madigan should resign if these allegations are proving true or are proven true. You're not offering that condition. Why not? Well, I, I, I view it, I, I did send a statement like that similar earlier on and he should be resigned. In, in my view, my statement um, related to his role as a House representative uh, my letter today in reflection is on his role as Speaker of the House, which is a very predominant leadership position, uh, one that requires public trust and integrity, which I think in the ComEd uh, Deferred Prosecution Agreement shows that that's been undermined by the ac actions and allegations that are in that document. And so I'm calling him to immediately step down as Speaker. Uh, if the allegations are true, I expect him to resign as State Representative. That could take uh, years to play out if the allegations are proven to be true, especially if he mounts a vigorous legal defense. Uh, to play that argument out, I expect some of the speaker's lawyers could say he didn't know this was going on and that these folks like Mike McLean or other members of his inner circle that were landing on ComEd's payroll, that all of this might have just happened without him knowing about it. Would you for a moment believe that that could possibly be true? Well, I think if that's the argument they're going to make, then that, that shows really a uh, dereliction of duty. Because if you're Speaker of the House, you should know if individuals are using your name or are promoting uh, favoritisms to, uh, to quote, uh, keep you happy, public official A to keep happy. Uh, that, that's a dereliction of duty that leads to undermining the trust and the integrity of the office of Speaker of the House. So just like you said, it could take years um, of guilt to be proven, but I think leadership in the House is very important, and we cannot have a Speaker of the House under FBI scrutiny or even listed in FBI documents. It's just simply, um, it's just simply wrong. And you raise the issue of a conflict of interest because as the House of Representatives and the Illinois Senate uh, consider this ethics discussion moving forward, 
I think you articulated in your letter to the speaker that that itself raises a conflict for him because he would be in charge of or would hold significant sway over the process and debate in writing new ethics rules that he himself might be bound by. That's 100% correct. We, and I believe that we as representatives in the House of uh, Illinois House need to look at the whole situation, not just with ComEd, but the whole process in which these decisions get made and, and where could be a check and balance put into place. Right now, all the employees in the Illinois House research staff, issue staff, fall under the sole discretion of the speaker. In fact, even our legislative assistants fall under that and, and we've been cut out of any process with them. So everybody falls under the onus and the, um, under the umbrella of the speaker of the house, which is why it is so important that we have uh, a, a person in there of integrity that has the public trust. And like you said, does not have a conflict of interest when we are looking at trying to get substantial ethics reform and this, we need to look at specifically ComEd and how this legislation came about. And he was uh, one of the chief um, organizers for it. Yeah, I, it, it's noteworthy that the deferred prosecution agreement came out 13 days before you wrote your letter. That strikes me because you did not immediately pounce on this. It seems you stopped and considered and read and thought this through, you mold it over. Was that a difficult decision? Was it hard for you to press send on that letter? Uh, it, it, it really is, it is. And as I, I opened my letter, um, I've been a state representative eight years. And I would say for the first four years, it's like drinking from a fire hose. You have to figure everything out. And I, I truly hold people um, in my heart to, to, to do the right thing. And I immediately sent out a statement that said, if they're true, he should resign uh, because to set that bar. And then, like you said, I read, I researched, I self-reflected, and um, this is just not the person, a, a leader that I, I can support. And it, it's, it's certainly not an individual that I think uh, right now with the public trust being broken with the integrity of the office of, of the speaker, being in question and the conflict of interest, it, I don't think he should be the Speaker of the House and should immediately step down. It's not often that we in the public get to peek behind the curtain in the deliberative process to see how lawmakers come to their uh, opinion. Sometimes in committee debate or in floor debate, we'll see snippets of it here or there, but those true moments where lawmakers have to wrestle with really heavy issues, we don't often see that, I think by design, because that's, that's a careful process Lawmakers want to make sure they're making the right decisions there. But in your conversations with your colleagues, how many other House Democrats are there right now who maybe are today where you were just yesterday or two days ago or three days ago wrestling with all this and thinking to themselves, I don't know if I can support this man for speaker any longer? Well, I, I don't know the number. Um, I think every every uh, individual in the in that in the house needs to reflect and, and personally digest these in, in their own way and in their own shape. It's very personal and it is very um, stressful. I had some nights I didn't sleep well thinking of this and I think a lot of my colleagues are going through the same process whether or not uh, they make the decision I did. I, I hold no judgment because uh, this is a very personal reflective thing to come out against an individual such as uh, the Speaker of the House, and to uh, stake a claim that this is just unacceptable behavior. And, and the um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, and and the unspoken part of this is that the Speaker offers immense power uh, when it comes time to win an election. He holds the purse strings of the Illinois Democratic Party. He is a prolific fundraiser. He's demonstrated that even in the last few days that he can still attract a pretty big haul, whether it's to pay for his lawyers or to help his colleagues win re-election. One way or the other, he can raise money and he can help. He's demonstrated that he can gain a majority in the House and hold on to it for a long period of time. How heavily does that factor weigh on the mind of some Democrats in swing districts who may face tough races this November? As they go to the ballot box, they have to say, I'm either in with him or I have to break with him. How does that weigh into their, their decision making? I think everything weighs into the decision making at this point in time. All factors involved, 
Um, and you know, this, this time around, I am fortunate to not have an opponent. I, I, you know, I just filed as we all did and, and I don't have a lot of money <laughs> in my account and, uh, that does weigh heavily. And that is another ethics, um, subject we need to broach is whether we will continue to allow somebody to be the chairman of the Democratic Party of Illinois, in addition to Speaker of the House, and, and look at those potential conflicts and, and where it can be used to solidify or to, um, you know, entrench uh, bad behavior. Yeah, because that's, that, it's an interesting thing because, for, for example, take uh, Senate President Don Harmon. He's the Senate President, but he also has a, a political action fund, uh, the Senate Democratic Victory Fund, which can be used uh, as sort of a fundraising arm to help maintain his majority. But that's a different level of power than the Democratic Party chairman, which oversees the congressional races and the local races and just the, the entire party structure itself. So it's, it, it doesn't seem like you're saying if you're Speaker of the House, you can't have a political action committee. It just seems like your, your feeling is that you shouldn't lead the whole party and hold the gavel. Correct. I think that's that's a subject matter that uh, myself and my colleagues have to have a serious conversation on whether uh, those leadership positions should be separate to allow for a little bit more accountability and checks and balances. And right now it's been held by the same individual for decades. Uh, this is the most gender diverse legislature in Illinois history. More women comprise the member of the Illinois Democratic Party than ever before. Um, so, so I want to include that context in this next question, but why do you think it is that only the only members of the Democratic Party so far to come forward and call for Speaker Madigan's unconditional and immediate resignation are six women? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, I can only speak for myself and, and I, I assume my other colleagues, we just have a, a desire to put Illinois on the right path and we uh, when we see something that's not right, um, you know, we have to speak up on that. And uh, whether that is uh, more unique to women or not, I, I'm not a professional on gender studies, but um, I do think that, you know, I tried to raise my children to do the right thing and to speak out when they see something that's wrong and to uh, stand up for themselves. And, and I think I, you know, maybe that's with my military experience or not, but I think that most women, uh, when they're raising their children, not saying that men don't instill this either, but we work really hard to be role models for, the, for our families. And, and, you know, we want to show that when you see something wrong, you have to stand up and you have to speak out. And, and we're doing it now as well. Does it bother you that more of your male colleagues have not joined your cause yet publicly? I, I'm not passing judgment on anybody. It's but would you like to see more men call for Speaker Madigan to resign? I, I would like people to join me, that's for certain, regardless if it's men or women. Um, I, I think that in order to get Illinois on the right path, um, this needs to happen. And, um, I, you know, overall, I'm not judging anybody, but I, I you know, obviously, sure. I think that uh, there's more, more strength in numbers. Who'd be a good Speaker of the House? You know, that's a process. It's a process that would come about if the speaker does step down um, and um, carefully evaluate anybody that puts their hat in the ring. Would you be interested in that yourself? Uh, right now, I haven't thought of any of that. I am just really uh, concerned about the integrity of the state of Illinois, our reputation, and, and we really need to start getting the state on the right path. Um, and. I think it starts with not having a speaker that's identified as public official A. Interesting. I want to pivot quickly. Uh, we're going to have uh, the Secretary, Secretary of the VA, the second largest federal agency in the government, join us uh, in a few moments, Robert Wilkie, uh, to talk about how the VA, um, among other things, has handled this coronavirus outbreak. Uh, obviously, during this time of social distancing, it's harder to meet people in person, but that's precisely where most veterans meet the first person that's going to help them get their benefits, is often in person in an office at a VA location somewhere across our state, you're a veteran. Uh, do you have those concerns that in these last four or five months or so that maybe some veterans have fallen by the wayside or have fallen out of touch with their benefits or they haven't been able to get plugged in? How can the state make sure that doesn't happen? Oh, I think that's a, a, a you know, really serious question. And, and I have to say, I've been on calls with, uh, with him and I appreciate all the information he's given us as chairs of uh, the Veterans Affairs Committees in that, in, 
uh, nationwide. And they are working really hard and it, it is very serious. And, um, you know, not even with claims, but depression, isolation, uh, relapses, and um, our veterans really are struggling. So our office is trying really hard to coordinate. I know all our um, county veterans assistance offices are remote. They answer questions. They are taking phone calls and they're trying to do all that they can. I'm also on the board of Illinois Joining Forces and we are making proactive calls to veterans to see how they're doing. And, and it really is a community effort. So we have to reach out to them and uh, reach out to the veterans and make sure that they're getting the services they need. And it is, it, it's, it's all around. I'm also on the governor's challenge to prevent veteran suicide. And we're talking about how COVID is really causing depression in, in veteran circles as well. So the whole COVID situation is affecting veterans profoundly. Well, I know our audience admires and respects and is grateful for, for your service, but also for the work that you do uh, in connecting with and uh, advocating for uh, so many of our veterans. It, it's, it's always great to see that camaraderie that exists between fellow service members, fellow veterans, uh, who, who know that even if they weren't in the same deployment, they share that share sacrifice and that, that bond. Right. No, there is, there is a fellowship amongst the generations of veterans. Um, and then myself as president of the Women Marine Association, Women Marines have a little bit of a unique bond as well. And, and Mark, I'm gonna take this time to say that I just shipped my uh, son off to Navy boot camp. Now I'm a Marine, he chose the Navy. I'm not gonna read into that. <laughs> <laughs> Marine Navy uh, uh, camaraderie there. But um, he's, he's right now, COVID has affected boot camp as well. He has to quarantine for two weeks before he even begins. So he's in his second week of quarantine. Um, so we're, my husband was in the army and, and we are definitely a veteran family and uh, veterans are um, so uh, awesome and um, they, they served our country and I served our country and we need to do all we can for them. Well, proud mother and you raise them right. Uh, I even noticed there, even in the family, some of that, uh, that, that jousting that goes on between the different branches of the military. I, I, it reminded me of one of my favorite quotes from a book, uh, Flags of Our Fathers, I believe it was, where in World War II, there was this jousting that would go on, this joking between uh, you know, the, the Marines who would say, well, sure, the Navy probably has our back, the Army might be there in a pinch, but the Air Force is barely even on our side. <laughs> I, I think it was tongue in cheek, but. And is that uh, an Air Force uh, joke here and there? So. <laughs> well, Secretary Wilkie, I think, is a Colonel in the Air Force Reserve, so we'll be sure not to bring that up when he's on our air. Um, but I give him my regards, and I appreciate all the Secretary's updates and calls that he does uh, for the veteran community. Before we let you go, what do you make of Governor Pritzker's restrictions on high school sports this fall? Is he drawing the right line or is he pushing this too far? We, you mentioned the, the side effects of these closures, this isolation that it has. Uh, I can speak personally that I know that my coaches, my teammates in high school were an instrumental part of my upbringing. And I know so many people who find strength and growth in those processes, in those moments. Um, it's a tough issue, but is the governor making the right call here? Well, I think the governor's call is based on safety for the children, first and foremost. Uh, right now, here in Aurora, we have a seven-year-old, a seven seven-year-old uh, from Allen Elementary School uh, that got COVID and has multi-organ inflammation and is in critical care. So mm -hmm. children are not immune to COVID, and and we have this serious case here in Aurora of this poor seven-year-old hooked up to every tube possible and their organs are fighting each other. So first and foremost, we have to look out for the safety of the children first. And I think this is an initial guideline as we've seen with the governor, he takes in all the information, he takes in feedback and um, you know, adjusts as time goes on and, and looks at all the information. So I think this is a first step, but uh, we really need to be careful with our children and, and COVID. Um, definitely strikes them like the seven-year-old we have in Aurora. All right, Representative Kipwood, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you for joining us. Uh, up next is the Secretary of the VA, Robert Wilkie. Don't miss it. We're back, we're back in a moment. All right, Representative Kipwood, thank you for joining us. We're going to have to leave it there. When we come back, another member of our military, a Colonel in the Air Force Reserve, Secretary Robert Wilkie, who heads up President Trump's Department of Veterans Affairs, joins us next. Stick around.